Amen. Thanks, Chandis. Awesome. So like Chandis said, my name is Amelia Koppel, and I'm the student pastor here. And so I'm so excited to be with you all this morning, especially with all the kids in the room. Let's see, where are the kids at? Raise your hand. Make some noise. Make some noise. Yeah, Luke, I see you. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> so feel free to make noise during the message. If you want to ask a question, if you want to answer a question that I have, it's all good, okay? So I'm a youth pastor, and that's what we do. <laughs> so, um, But last week, if you were not here, um, we started a new series. So we just finished up our series on the Beatitudes, and today um, we're continuing in our series called, in other words, the stories of Jesus. And we're going to be looking at different parables throughout the Gospels. Now, if you're wondering, what's a parable? Well, let me tell you. Parables are basically stories that Jesus tells throughout his ministry to teach and often used to illustrate what the kingdom of God is like, the kingdom that Jesus ushered in. So if you see at the beginning of most parables, we see Jesus starting out by saying, the kingdom of God is like, and then he tells this story. And sometimes people get it, sometimes people don't. Sometimes his disciples are like, Jesus, what did you mean there? And he sometimes explains it and they get it, sometimes not. But parables are such a cool way that Jesus uses to teach. And so the parable we'll be talking about today is found in Matthew 18 and it's all about forgiveness. Can you think of a time in your life or maybe even in the past week when someone hurt you? Whether it was with words or with actions, intentional or unintentional. Maybe it was your sibling, your mom, dad, your spouse, your friend or your neighbor or classmate. Well, we aren't in school now, so probably not your classmate. But what was your response to that hurt, your first response? It was probably to be sad or upset, maybe to be angry or just feeling like really, really hurt inside. And that's typically our natural reaction, our first response. It's, it's like normal for people to feel that way. And then maybe they came up to you right away or later and apologized and asked if you'd forgive them. Maybe you forgave them right away. Maybe you didn't. Maybe you did later. Or maybe you haven't at all. And depending on the level of hurt they cause, the forgiveness can vary in difficulty to give. But when Jesus talks about forgiveness, both here in this parable that we'll look at and throughout the New Testament and and throughout the Old Testament, we see that that forgiveness is something he views as so important. And as followers of him, something that we will do, even when it's hard, really hard. And it can take time to be ready to forgive, and that's okay. Because forgiveness can be even a really hard or uncomfortable topic to even talk about. Forgiveness um, might be a sensitive topic for you, especially when you have experienced really deep pain at the hands of another in your life. And if that's you, I'd encourage you to just listen and hear what God might want to say to you through his word this morning. Don't worry, I'm not going to stand up here and tell you that you need to forgive everyone who's ever hurt you right now this morning, okay? I'm not going to do that, so I'll let you off the hook there. (laughs) But I do want to challenge you to take a step towards forgiveness this morning, and we'll look at what that could look like in your life later. But forgiveness is a heart posture towards those who have hurt you, and sometimes it takes a long time to get to that point where you're ready to to be there, to change that heart posture towards them. It could take the help of others to get you there, such as friends or a counselor. Because you see, forgiveness is much more than just words that you say. It's much more than I forgive you. Forgiveness is an inner heart posture. And so today, I hope and pray that you hear from God and maybe you feel like you can take a step towards forgiveness in some way. So I'm gonna pray and prepare our hearts and our minds for what God might be wanting to say to us this morning. 
So God, thank you so much for just the chance to be together, to worship you. Lord, I pray that, um, that you would calm any distracting thoughts that may be in our head. Lord, that you would open our hearts and our minds to what you might want to say to us this morning. Lord, speak through your word. Amen. So if you haven't already opened up your Bibles, open them up to Matthew 18. If you don't have a physical Bible and you want one, we have some in the back um, bookshelf back there, so you feel free to grab one. You can keep it if you want as well. Um, but we'll also have the verses on the screen for you this morning. So Matthew 8 or 18, we're going to be starting in verse 21. So it's the latter half of the chapter. We're going to read all the way through 35. So buckle up. <laughs> so starting in verse 21. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Just so you know, 10,000 bags of gold is a lot of money, okay? The word 10,000 here in Greek is myrios, where we get myriad. It's the highest numeral that they had in Greek. Okay, so they're just saying the biggest number you could think of and a bag of gold or they meant um, in here, uh, let's see, what was it again? A talent. That's also like the highest currency. So basically Jesus is just saying this guy owes him a bajillion dollars. Okay, the largest amount you could think of. It's unrealistic and his hearers know that. It's almost laughable at the amount of money this guy owes. Okay. So he began the settlement, a man who owed him a bajillion dollars was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. Now, just so you know, that's not a lot of money. I mean, it is, but compared to what the other guy owed, it's like basically four months of working, okay? So he owed him a hundred silver coins and he grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay it back. That's what the, the other servant just said, right? But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed, which was never going to happen. Remember, a bajillion dollars. You don't make money in jail either. And then Jesus finishes the parable with this. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Wow, what a fun parable to go through this morning, right? <laughs> so the king in this story is, is representing God, who is abundantly generous and cancels this massive debt of his servant who owed him more than he could ever possibly repay. So generous, so forgiving, so merciful, that's our God. What is the biggest debt that you have? The biggest financial debt that you have? Anyone? Home, mortgage, yeah, <laughs> same, <laughs> it's a big one. 
So you probably have mortgage for the adults in the room. Maybe you have student loans. I know some of you are in college. Josiah, hopefully you don't have a student loan yet. Um, maybe you have a car loan or medical bills, credit card. So much debt. We love debt, right? <laughs> no. How would you feel if someone came along and paid for all of your debt? That'd be pretty cool, right? <laughs> That'd be awesome. I don't even know how I would feel because it just feels so out of this world. Like that would never happen. Like that's a lot of money. If that happened though, how would it change you? If you had all of your debt forgiven, would it change the way you interacted with others? Would it change the way you viewed people? Maybe it would make you more generous, maybe more forgiving. Maybe you'd want to pay it forward in some way. We would know just how much we have been forgiven. And we'd want to do that for others, right? That's what you'd think. But in this story, we see that not happening. We see this servant who had this massive, insurmountable debt forgiven and canceled, and then he went out and found someone who owed him a little bit of money, and he forced him to pay it back, and when he couldn't, he threw him in jail. It just doesn't make sense to us why he would do that when he had such incredible mercy shown to him. I mean, that's never something we would do. Is it? No, right? <laughs> and so when the king heard about this, he brought him back in, angry, told him that he should have had mercy on his fellow servant, like he, the king had on him, and threw him into prison to be tortured till he could pay it back, which again, is impossible to do. And when Jesus concludes this parable, he makes it clear what it means if we didn't already get it. When he says, this is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. I mean, that's a scary statement. Something that we should not take lightly. And it shows just how important Jesus views forgiveness. Earlier in Matthew, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus talks about forgiveness there as well. In his famous prayer, which we now call the Lord's Prayer, which was what his disciples, um, they asked him how to pray, and Jesus gave them this prayer. And if you know this prayer, you'll know that in there, there's a line about forgiveness. And so feel free to join me. We're just going to read this prayer together. It's, let's see if it's on the screen, maybe. Yeah, awesome. So this is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Yeah. So that is the Lord's prayer. For in, in there he says, forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Now, when you were younger, maybe you learned a different version of this. Sometimes it's trespasses or it's sin. Really, it all means the same thing. What's important is this idea that God forgives our debts and we forgive the debts of others. Jesus expects this of his followers. And if they didn't quite get it, he goes on to say right after the prayer to clarify this topic. He says in verses 14 and 15, for if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your father will not forgive your sins. So if you forgive others, God will forgive you. If you don't forgive others, God will not forgive you. Jesus puts it really plainly. And does that sound a little familiar? Like the parable we just read? Yeah, it's like Jesus was using this parable to, to further explain what he talked about earlier in the Sermon on the Mount. This idea of you're forgiven, so you should forgive. 
This is the basis for kingdom forgiveness. And remember, this parable was meant to teach on what the kingdom is like. So in the kingdom of God, forgiveness is key. The forgiveness God offers us and us receiving that forgiveness and then us showing that forgiveness to others around us. So what really is forgiveness? I mean, it's a word that we see all the time, we hear it all the time, we use it, maybe not all the time, but <laughs> do we truly know what it means or how to do it? I mean, we think, oh, someone hurts you, so you forgive them. Okay, cool, but if it's so simple, why is it so hard? Well, first, let's look at the Greek word here that Jesus uses for forgive. It's this word, aphiomi. Aphiomi. Isn't that a fun word? Yeah. Aphiomi basically means to let go, to release, or to forgive. It's language that we often use when we're carrying or holding on to something. Release it, let it go, set it down, especially if it's heavy, like this backpack here that has like 25 pounds in it. Sometimes you just need to let it go. <laughs> oh, get a little break there. <laughs> but it's this idea of like you're carrying something really heavy and you, and you just release it. You let it go. That's what this word forgiveness means here. And it's interesting that in this parable and in the Lord's Prayer, Jesus uses the language of finances, of debt. I mean, that's something we know, but when we hear that language, it almost makes us think other things, of like our finances and everything. But really, debt is an idea of, of someone owing something. Say someone breaks something of yours, whether it's your toy or runs into your car or something. What's your response going to be? Oh, that's okay. Don't worry about it. I mean, sometimes that is your response. But other times you're like, you owe me. You have to pay that back. Like, <laughs> you, you need to replace what you broke. That's the idea that Jesus is trying to get across here. The idea of owing someone something usually money in this case. But we use that language of owing sometimes after we get hurt as well. So you, say you get hurt really bad, whether it's physically or, like, or just emotionally, and we have this idea of like, you owe me. You hurt me, so you owe me. Or, or you deserve to get hurt as well. And Jesus is using this language of owing and of debt in talking about forgiveness. And essentially he's saying that to forgive a person is to release their debt to you, to let go of what they owe you. If we were to get justice, they would pay for what they did. But forgiveness, on the other hand, is paying it yourself by absorbing that debt and letting it go. Because you aren't getting that money back. You aren't getting that, that piece of you that was hurt back. But you're letting it go. There's a beautiful example of this in the Old Testament in Leviticus 25. Leviticus gets a lot of hate, but I think there are some beautiful things in it, like this. There's what's known as the year of Jubilee. Have you ever heard of that? Some of you, yeah? Okay, so the year of Jubilee is basically every seven years, all debts are forgiven or released or canceled. They're a fiamid. <laughs> and every, every slave is set free, things go back to who they originally belonged to and more. It's this beautiful thing, this beautiful year of, of letting go. And the Greek word aphiomi is used 50 times in this chapter alone in the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament. So essentially, this is the year of jubilee or the year of release, the year of letting go. 
Forgiveness is central to God's character and to his people. And so this idea of releasing a debt, forgiving it, paying it yourself by absorbing it, that's what we see the king do in the parable here. He doesn't make him pay it back, but he takes it on himself and he cancels it. Now clearly the king has a lot of money if he was even even able to lend him this amount. But instead of seeking justice and making him pay it back, he forgave it. He had mercy on him. He canceled that debt. He let it go. And in a way, he paid the debt himself by doing that. Hmm. It kind of sounds like someone else I know. Maybe Jesus? Does it sound a little like Jesus? Yeah, I thought so. (laughs) This is what Jesus did on the cross. He took on all of our sin, all of the pain that we even caused other people, all of their backpacks that they're carrying around because of the pain that others have caused them, all of the mistakes we ever made. He took it all on himself and he paid for it. He paid that debt off with his life. He pays the debt on behalf of all humanity that ever existed and ever will exist, and he covered it all. He released it. He let it go. So we don't owe him anymore. Because do you realize what the payment for our sins is? I heard it over here. What was it? Death, yes. Romans 6.23 says, for the wages of sin is death. That's what we deserve. That's what we're supposed to owe. But Jesus decided to pay that for us. And Jesus didn't just pay the price for our sins. He also gave us the gift of eternal life in Christ Jesus. Because Romans 6.23 goes on to say, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. He gives us this gift of eternal life in Christ Jesus. 1 John 1.9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. We must recognize our sins, that we are broken and sinful and confess that to God. And when we do that, we see that he will forgive it all. And that's what happens when we enter into a relationship with him that all of our sins, past, present, and future, are forgiven, are let go. And we get the gift of eternal life with God that starts now and lasts forever. What a generous gift that is. What a generous God we have. And if we really see and recognize the huge, insurmountable debt that he has forgiven us of, that should change us. That should change the way we treat others. Because guess who else Jesus forgave the sins of and covered and let go and paid for? That person who hurt you. The person who wronged you. Jesus forgave them too, just like he did you. And so, of course, we want our debts all paid for and forgiven. But Jesus, do you have to forgive them too? They they really hurt me. We need to, to remind ourselves and change the way we view others as seeing them as someone who has been forgiven by God. Because we can't find ourselves denying them of their debts being paid and forgiven, but us wanting that. That just can't be. And the forgiveness that happens on the cross is the reason why we can and should forgive others. Because our forgiveness flows out of being a recipient of the forgiveness that God gives us. And if he's forgiven such a massive debt, 
we should be able to forgive the small debts, small in comparison to the debt we owed God, of others. And that's the whole point of this parable in Matthew 18. That when we choose to follow Jesus, we have to first see ourselves as someone who is forgiven. And then we can start to see others who hurt us as people who have been forgiven by God as well. And then we can in turn forgive them. We forgive because we're forgiven. That's what this parable means. And it sounds simple, but that's, that's what... That's what Jesus is saying here. We forgive because we're forgiven. Now, of course, that is often much easier said than done. When we're hurt, forgiveness may not come quickly or easily, especially depending on the depth of that hurt. And it's okay to be upset. It's okay to be hurt and for it to be hard to do and for it to take time, even if it's years. But, if you refuse to forgive or you choose to never forgive a person, Jesus says you aren't one of his disciples. Jesus says you you won't be forgiven if you choose to do that, if you choose to not forgive a person. That just shows that you probably never really understood or grasped the reality of God's forgiveness he gave you in the first place, just like the first servant in the parable. He had this massive debt forgiven, but it changed nothing in him. It meant nothing to him. And we see that by the way he treated the other servant. And he ended up paying the price for that. But if we truly understood the forgiveness God has shown us, we can't not forgive others. Forgiveness is more than just the words, I forgive you. It's an internal heart posture towards the person who hurt you, regardless of if there were to be any reconciliation or not. Jesus says you need to forgive from your heart at the end of the parable. It's viewing them as someone worthy of Jesus' love and forgiveness and then treating them as such. Forgiveness is from the heart, not just with our words. And that means sometimes forgiveness may take a while. It may take time for you to be in a space or to be ready for that internal change towards them. That's why I'm not gonna be up here saying, you need to go forgive right now because you may not be ready for that. Because it's much more than just saying the words. That's easy. But if it was a true heart change, that takes time. Another thing that I want to talk about briefly is what forgiveness is not. Lewis Smeads in his book, The Art of Forgiving, he talks about this and so much more. But I want to briefly go over it. So what is forgiveness not? Yeah, there we go. So forgiveness is not ignoring or forgetting. He's not saying forgive and forget, okay? That's just not realistic. Forgetting is minimizing what's been done. And he's not saying that you should do that. Forgiveness is not condoning or excusing. Forgiveness is not tolerating or allowing further abuse. Forgiveness is also not reconciliation or restoration. Forgiveness does not mean that things go back to the way they were. And it does not mean that the offender escapes consequences or injustice. That is what forgiveness is not. Okay? Jesus is not saying that you just roll over and take it again and again and again, and they can do whatever to you, and you just have to keep forgiving them. That is not at all what Jesus is saying here. Right before the parable... When we started reading, Peter asked the question, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? I mean, Peter is probably thinking he's being really generous with his answer. Like seven times? That's so many times. And Jesus said, not seven times, but 77 times. 
Some translations even say seven times 70. So whether it's 77 or 490, the point is that Jesus is making is it's an, an unlimited number of times. You're not gonna be counting and when you get to 78, you don't have to forgive them. That is not what Jesus is saying. He's saying it's not about the number. However, this passage and the one before it on church discipline have been misused and abused in faith communities to keep people in abusive and harmful relationships. And that is not okay. Because that is reading scripture wrong. Because that is not something that Jesus would ever want. He isn't saying that no matter what someone does to you, you have to keep forgiving them. Right before this, when Jesus talks about dealing with sin in the church, he says, first bring it to the person one-on-one. -on -one. And if they, if they receive it, if they repent, then, then great, you're good. If not, bring a couple other people with you to talk about them. Bring some mediators in there. He's, not, he's basically saying, don't be alone with them anymore if this is the case. And if that works, great. If not, bring it to the whole church. If that works, awesome. If not, Treat them as someone who, is, who doesn't know Jesus. This is more about reconciliation or restoration. This is not about forgiveness. In Luke 17, Jesus talks about forgiveness there, kind of in the, the parallel passage. Um, but it shows that this kind of unlimited forgiveness also requires repentance. Jesus says in verses three through four, if your brother or sister sins against you, rebuke them, and if they repent, forgive them. Even if they sin against you seven times in a day and seven times come back to you saying, I repent, you must forgive them. And repentance is a complete 180, a change of directions, changing the behavior and the attitude and going the other way. But when there isn't repentance, you don't need to keep forgiving and reconciling with them. You can still forgive them on your own because that is a personal thing in your heart, but you don't need to continue a relationship with that person. You'll have to work to not harbor grudges or be bitter or, or want revenge along with working to forgive, but reconciliation cannot happen without repentance. But forgiveness and reconciliation are not the same things. Forgiveness takes one and reconciliation takes two. Forgiveness has to happen in order for reconciliation to happen, but reconciliation does not have to, have to happen for forgiveness to happen. And there are many times when it, reconciliation would not be safe or healthy. To continue having a relationship with that person would not be good, like in abusive relationships. Forgiveness doesn't even have to be spoken to the other person, especially in those situations. But forgiveness is more for you, not for the other person. It's your own heart, your own heart posture towards them. And even to follow what Christ calls us to do, forgiveness needs to happen in order for true healing to take place. Now, I remember a time a few years ago when I came to a place where I decided it was time to forgive a person who really hurt me. And so I actually asked a couple people to join me and we spent a few hours working through forgiveness because I decided I didn't wanna keep carrying around this weight of unforgiveness and hurt anymore. And it was hard and it was painful, but it was good and healing. And I was able to forgive that person and, and have that shift internally towards them. Now, I didn't go and reach out to them. I don't want to go and be around them anymore because that wouldn't be safe. I wouldn't feel comfortable with that. But forgiveness isn't really for the other person. Forgiveness is for yourself, for your own heart. You are the one to benefit from forgiving others. Now, if you want to reconcile with that person, forgiveness is also needed for that and for the other person. But first and foremost, forgiveness is for your own heart. We forgive because we're forgiven. And I was able to do that then. But forgiveness is an ongoing thing. 
Because there's always going to be people that hurt you, that offend you, that, that do some, does something that, that really hurts. And it's something I'm even working on right now and don't feel quite ready to do. And I know that I will, but I'm not ready yet. And maybe you feel similarly, and that's okay. Maybe today we can step, take one step closer towards forgiveness. At the end of the parable, we see that this man who couldn't forgive, he ends up in jail, being tortured. And it's as if Jesus is depicting someone who can't forgive as being trapped and tortured. And in a way, they are. Unforgiveness traps us in a state of pain and hurt that can ruin us. Lisa Turkhurst, in her book, Forgiving What You Can't Forget, says, staying here, blaming them, and forever defining your life by what they did will only increase the pain. Worse, it will keep projecting out onto others. The more our pain consumes us, the more it will control us. That is not something we want. We don't want our pain and our hurt to control and consume us because the longer it does, the harder it will be to get rid of it and the harder our hearts will become. In that book, The Art of Forgiving by Lewis Smedes, also I just love his last name. Smeeds. Sounds like a pirate to me. Um, <laughs> but in this book, he shares a story. And he says, I know a man of 70 who says he was once cheated out of a promised retirement bonus 15 years ago. He knows for sure who did it. It was the new vice president in charge of personnel. Everyone who has spent more than 15 minutes with him or more than two miles knows it. The postman knows it. The woman at the checkout counter knows it. His rage has become his very being. He has become his bitterness. He breathes it, sleeps with it, and will probably die in it. In fact, he may die of it. The poison has splattered his organs and an ulcer now bleeds on the lining of his once healthy stomach. He has waited too long. If he now forgave the man, he would not know who he was. He could still do it, and maybe he will, but his postponements have made it dreadfully hard. That's not a pretty picture. We cannot let ourselves be a prisoner to unforgiveness because it's not worth it. And the only person you're really hurting is yourself. Smeed says, when we forgive, we set a prisoner free and discover that that prisoner we set free is us. Forgiveness sets us free. And we forgive because we've been forgiven. And as followers of Jesus, we are called to forgive others. And we can do that because we know what forgiveness is like. We have been forgiven such a massive debt. And out of that place of being forgiven, we can then have a posture of forgiveness and practice it. Forgiveness is a heart posture towards that person who has hurt you. And by releasing them of that debt, you are no longer allowing the wrong they did to have power over you or define you. Let it go, set it down. You don't need to carry it anymore. Set down the backpack full of hurt and unforgiveness. Release it. Let it go. It's a form of, of torture and imprisonment. Sometimes we've carried it for so long, it just becomes a part of us. You forget that you're even carrying it. But that's what people see. They're looking at you like, why are you carrying that heavy backpack? Why don't you just set it down? Why don't you let it go? What are you doing? And maybe you start to think that it's actually making you stronger holding on to that. It makes you a stronger person. But it doesn't. It's just slowing you down. 
It's a heavy burden that you're, you're carrying. And if you released it and let it go, you'd experience a freedom and lightness that you didn't even know was possible. That's what forgiveness can do. It doesn't mean the pain will be gone. It doesn't mean that you'll forget what happened, nor should you. But it will bring healing to your own heart and freedom to your soul. More than just letting it go and releasing it, you can, you can give it to God. He can carry it. He is so much stronger than me. He can carry all of your backpacks at the same time. And that's what he does. That's what he did. And even if you aren't ready to let go of one thing at a time or let go of the whole thing, you can let go of one thing at a time, which I'm going to struggle to do. There we go. <laughs> if you're like, okay, I can let go of one thing today. There you go. I'm going to let that go. I'm going to release another thing tomorrow. Sorry if I'm breaking the stage. I don't mean to. <laughs> there are only five pounds there. But What's one thing you can release today? If you can't let it all go today, take off one, one little bit. Give it to God. Let him carry it. He's so much better at it than you are. You don't need to carry all that hurt and pain anymore. Worship team, you can come back up. But... What is, I want to challenge you with, what is one step you can take towards forgiveness today? Maybe you've never really received the forgiveness God offers you. And there's never a better time to do that than right now. Jesus has already paid the price for your sins, so you don't have to. All you need to do is recognize that you have sinned, confess that to God, and receive the forgiveness that he offers. Like it says in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. And as we move into worship and ministry time, I'd encourage you to use that time to do that. And we'd love to come alongside you and help you in that to talk about what it means to follow Jesus, what it means to be forgiven. So we'll have the prayer team around the room. I'll be up here. Just come and talk to us or talk to a friend about it. Receive the forgiveness God offers you. Or maybe you find yourself knowing that you've hurt someone and you need to go to them and ask for forgiveness. If that person's in the room, do it this morning. If not, set up a time to do so later. Apologize for what you've done and ask for forgiveness. Or maybe you feel like you're carrying a really heavy backpack around and you need to, to forgive someone who has hurt you. And maybe you aren't ready to do that today and that's okay but maybe you can take a step towards that. Maybe during this time, you spend some time praying that God would soften your heart towards that person. Or maybe you spend time praying for that person because it's really hard to hate a person or be mad at a person when you're praying for them. So maybe you spend some time praying for the person who hurt you. Or if you do feel ready, take that step of forgiving releasing, letting go. And if you want help doing that, come and talk to, to me or someone on the prayer team and we'd love to pray for you and pray with you and help you to do that. There's also communion available throughout the room. I think we have some over there, maybe in the back of the room too. If you want to participate in and remember the forgiveness that God gave us, that Jesus paid for on the cross, Go and partake in communion and remind yourself of that and thank the Lord for that. There's also a cross over here in the corner with paper and pens. If you wanna just write down something, maybe it's a way that someone's hurt you and you decide you wanna forgive them, you can write that down and pin it on the cross. Take something out of your backpack and give it to the Lord this morning. 
Forgiveness is so powerful. One of my favorite stories of forgiveness that I'll end with, and I'm sorry, sorry if I've shared this before, I just love this story and think it's really powerful. But it's that of Rachel Denolander at Larry Nassar's trial. I mean, Larry Nassar was the Michigan State University and USA Gymnastics doctor, and he was sentenced to up to 175 years in prison after 156 women and girls came forward and said in court that he sexually abused them over the last 20 years. And one of them was Rachel, and she was the first to make public allegations against Nassar. She was only 15 years old when he started abusing her. And some of the other girls were as young as 10. And among the many things Rachel shared during the trial, this quote here of hers is a beautiful expression of love, forgiveness, and grace and truth. She said, if the Bible you carry says it's better for a stone to be thrown around your neck and you thrown into a lake than for you to make even one child stumble, and you have damaged hundreds, the Bible you speak carries a final judgment where all of God's wrath and eternal terror is poured out on men like you. And should you ever reach the point of truly facing what you have done, the guilt will be crushing. And that is what makes the gospel of Christ so sweet. Because it extends grace and hope and mercy where none should be found. And it will be there for you. And I pray you experience the soul-crushing weight of guilt so you may someday experience true repentance and true forgiveness from God, which you need far more than forgiveness from me, though I extend that to you as well. How powerful is that? Of her being able to, to extend that forgiveness. And there is grace and hope and mercy and forgiveness in Christ no matter what a person has done. She was able to extend forgiveness to this man who hurt her so deeply and that's because she knows she has been forgiven of so much. We forgive because we've been forgiven. So let's pray and then we're gonna worship and respond however you feel God is leading you this morning. I challenge you, take a step towards forgiveness in some way today. Lord, we thank you for the forgiveness you have given us. Lord, help us to not take that for granted. Help us to not take that lightly, but help help it change us and the way that we treat others. Lord, you know, you know the hurt that we've been carrying each and every one of us. You know the pain. You know it so well. So Lord, I pray that you would help us take a step towards forgiveness and towards you this morning. Lord, I pray for healing in this room. I pray for for forgiveness to happen, for heavy backpacks to be set down and released to you. Lord, we love you.